Welcome to another edition of Conversations with a Legend, presented by Up On Game. This one is a special one for me. This one I'm truly excited for. I might sound like I'm in my radio voice, but that's only because I'm trying to sound like, well, lion when he summoned the rest of the Thundercats. I have the man, the myth, the legend, John Randall, who made it famous in the National Football League. Thunder. 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 Thundercats. Oh. All right. All right, man. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Always, always an honor to talk to you and so much wisdom. Uh, I can't wait for people to hear what it is that that your knowledge level is because man, you one of the most brilliant dudes I've ever been around. So without further ado, seven time pro bowler. Oh man. Let's see. Six time, first team, all pro. Uh, you were an NFL sacks leader at one point in your career. Uh, Hall of Famer, uh, 50 greatest Vikings, I mean, I can't even memorize all this. You part of the 100, 100 sacks, sacks club. You just, your resume is is impeccable. It's 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 a long, long laundry list of, of accomplishments. John Randall, who is from, all right, now, everybody has been from some Carolina that I've interviewed. I, I, I hit Wheeler <laughs> up. And and Thomas Thomas Davis Senior up now we just did O Pace last week finally a different state Ohio and now we go to a different state the state of Texas with with you that's that's the origin just tell me a little bit about where you're from OG and and just give me give me an idea of roughly what 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 the area was like what what you came up in i know it is very well documented obviously but for those out there who may need to be refreshed on john randall the great the defensive tackle that played so many years did it for the the seahawks did it for the vikings did it for so many teams um what what was your beginning what was your beginning like well first of all thank you it is indeed an honor to be in your presence. Come on, man. And, uh, yes, yes, Come man. On. But let me tell you, okay, where I grew up in the state of Texas, uh, it was pretty much called Central Texas. I grew up in a small town. It was 150 people. It was basically an old plantation. 150 town. people. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. My mom, wow. my mom, uh, she chopped cotton. She picked cotton. All my aunts picked it and chopped it. I grew up chopping cotton uh, during the junior high. Uh, you would pay $2 an hour to do this. But basically, you started by 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday through Fridays. Uh, we had a general store. And then we had a black owned juke joint. That wow. Where we were Duke kids, were kind of you, yeah, you know, juke yeah, oh yeah, y'all had to sneak under the boards, look under the boards, yeah. and all that. Oh look yeah, the crack so windows. Yeah, it, it, and it actually had two windows in the front, pool table, a little uh, jukebox, and kids weren't allowed to go there. Right. So, but the general store was was kind of like near it, so we could go over to the general store and listen to the music on Friday night, Saturday night. And, you know, they were started drinking and, and people were having fun. So yeah. that's kind of where I grew up. It was very rural. Um, people didn't have much money, but there was lots of fun and you knew each other. And uh, it was a good mixture of people that in the area and uh, the school was right. My junior high was right behind my house, <laughs> but the junior high only went through kindergarten to the eighth grade. Then after that, you have to take a, a bus eight miles away, then get off that bus and get on another bus to go to high school. Wow. So you was commuting. That, yes, sir. Yeah. So it was, it was, I thought it was normal. I thought that was the way of the world, even down to the part where we didn't have indoor running water. We, we didn't have indoor bathroom. Wow. Our house was small. It was myself, my two older brothers, and my mother. And uh, we didn't have much, but 
you know, to me, I thought it was kind of the normal way, but um, going to high school is where I started seeing the different things where, you know, people want to go on outside to go to the bathroom. I mean, I, I junior high had it, but I just thought that's the way the schools were, but most homes where I thought was set up the way, <clears throat> excuse me, was the way that everybody else lived. Yeah. All right. So with all of that, you're taking care of family business with, with mom and I'm sure the brothers as well. Everybody's out there doing their duties. How, how did that lead to football and 150 people in, in your town? How, how did football become an idea thought? Was it a dream? Was it a necessity? What was it to John Randall? Uh, For me personally, my brother played high school football, but for me, I, I I was kind of on you. I not big, but I was kind of a different kid. My hands were bigger. My when I was in junior high, I think my foot was a size at a size eleven. Wow! By the time I was in the eighth grade, mm-hmm. so the kids kind of not say picked on me, but joked about it because they would call me Big Foot. Big, right? I had the big hands, right? And so playing football was kind of an out, out um, tell you an out way, an out lich way of going for me because my brother played and so I wanted to try it. So I had a lot of energy. I remember sitting in class, man, I felt like one of those uh, Marvel characters where I just like, man, I can't wait to go outside. <laughs> I can't wait to be out there on the, on the, on the grass. Uh, can we play soccer and ram? I'm like, I can't wait to go outside. Right. I can't wait. But when I got to high school, I saw kids who were like me, who had big hands, big feet. And all of a sudden, man, it just kind of clicked. Like, yeah, there are other people like me. Uh-huh. And I remember when we getting ready to go to high school, first day, these kids were from my town called Mumford, were laughing, going, man, you, you had a hard time in Mumford. How big of a difference you're going to have once you get to Hearn? And Herm was a town of about 5,000 people. Okay, so it was bigger. Yeah. Okay. So when I got there, I had we started practicing football, and I met a lot of people. So the first day of school, we get off the bus, and all of a sudden, I hear people hollering my name, John, 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 John. I fit right in. Uh-huh. And all my friends now, people I grew up with, were having a difficult time relating to people. Hmm. And – there, I mean, I can, because, man, it was so many things. Like, first day of practice, I remember I went in there, I needed a pair of football cleats. And I walked up to the co- to the uh, trainer, and I said, I need a pair of size 13. A 13? And I was expecting him, yeah, I was expecting him to say 13. Right. No. He, he, just, he just turned around and said, give me some 13. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man. I'm like, you got 13? He got, yeah, we got 13. We got 14. Dang. But you don't need no 14, so get out of here. So I got my shoes. Man, it was like, yes, this is where I belong. Mm. I found home. and But the most difficult part of it for me wasn't the football. I could deal with the practice. Okay. I could deal with the running around, get a hitting. But the most difficult part for me was trying to get a ride home. Oh, wow. After practice. And sometimes I wouldn't get home till 11 and 12 o'clock at night. Wow. And then when I got home, I would sit there be doing my homework, but thinking about how was I going to get home tomorrow? Right, man. And the next day. And I went through that for four years of high school, but it, to me, being around people that I could relate to, people that I could trust and count on, mm-hmm. man, I said, it's worth, worth getting it. home at 11 o'clock, wow. 12 o'clock, because the relationship I built with those guys in high school, man, I still talk to a lot of those guys. We still connected. I mean, some of them are in uh, Memphis, some of them are in Nashville, some of them are in California. One of them, uh, he's in... Um, He's in like uh, New England. Okay. One of them is overseas, but we still have that. That connection. bond. Yeah. Yes. And 
I tell people all the time, I said, man, that's what's so crazy about football. It brings people together. And, th- and it doesn't matter if you're black, mm-hmm. white, you're Hispanic. It brings that connection. And I I was just talking to a buddy of mine from, from, from uh, matter of fact, from Mumford, who was, his son is going to University of Texas. And how you I feel about that? How you feel about that? Well, I'm about, about going to SA. You okay with it? I'm okay with it. All right. I'm okay. Yeah. I, my thing is, which I love helping people grow, helping people make their way on their on their journey. Yes. And because sometimes we we get lost. Sometimes we need help. And I love doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you you're an Aggie. That's why I had to ask. No, 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 no. I'm not an Aggie. So, oh my God. So my God. Me- so my school. Uh, so my school is is, is is it was called Texas and Te- and I. Which, and, it was and a black Kingsville. college. No, no, no. All right, they t- t- clear me up on this. Don't, come on, okay. Come yeah. on to me. Clear this one up because I thought you I'm were an Aggie. Oh no, 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 right. no. I grew up there. College Station was like. 20 miles away. Okay. My school was Texas and I and uh King at Kingsville. So it was in. like kind of like the same thing as the Texas Aggies, but it had an I instead of an M. No, no. We, hey, we we were called Havelinas. We were hogs. Oh now, oh, oh. Here's, now here's I was trying the, to make it good for you, John. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Try- <laughs> I mean, I'll make it, I'll make it good. Let all right. Me, all let right. me bring it around for okay, you. Okay, bring so, it, bring it to me. When I got there, there was two guys, two previous gentleman who had attended this school and they told me listen you're coming to a school that has very, very high standard okay and I'm, and I'm like not knowing much about school I'm going really who 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 came through this school they said Gene Upshaw Daryl Green wow so oh that's they go, that's two names yes they said Hall of Fame I go oh man you you got to be doing something to come out of this school. Mm-hmm. And they said, exactly. <laughs> they said, exactly. They got go, you. Yeah. And, but, you know, uh, the school was small, but we've had at least, I'd say, about 30, 40 guys who have made it to the National Football wow. League from a Division II school. Wow. Division II. That's awesome. Okay. And, yeah, so that's that's the school, but it's it's a great little school. Now, um, there was a, a, a offensive coordinator. He was uh, Peyton Manning's offensive coordinator, Tom Moore. Okay, Tom Tom Moore t- told me he goes, John. I went down to Kingsville, Texas. I saw where you went to school at. I said, What do you think of it, Tom? Tom said, If a man had six months to live down in Kingsville. Those six months would be the longest time oh, of no. his life. Oh no! He goes, yeah, because it wasn't it wasn't much down there, man. Okay, but it's it was it was a great school for for sports, football. You could focus. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Let me let me let me ask you this because you are a super highly educated man, and you you communicate in such a way. Very, very few people can match the energy and and just the delivery of what you're doing. I see you you got your logo in the background with the Legends community. What what are you up to these days? And and just the idea of learning how to communicate because a lot of times we don't take that seriously. Just being able to yeah. communicate the right way and present yourself the right way. Um, we can be scary because of our yeah. our hands and our feet and our, our looks. Yep. We we can intimidate. We can maybe maybe even make it a little difficult for opportunities just based off of the intimidation factor. For you to be as stone cold as you were on that field, you are one of the most loved dudes, lovable dudes, and it resonates. It's not forced. It's not. Thank it's you. not an act. It's just. It just. It's something that everyone should strive to to be. What What's your role? I know you're involved in the Legends community. It, you know everything that you got going on right now, including the Legends community. Anything else? What What does John Randall have going on right now with all that you've accomplished? Because I'm sure everybody wants to work with you. Yeah, everybody always asks me, "What am I doing?" This and that, and uh, God, I, 
one of the things with my, I have my kids are 17 years old. I have twins, a boy and a girl. Mm-hmm. And my son uh, became septic and, and he almost passed away. Oh, wow. And so he's a special needs okay. kid. So we worked with a, uh, a school here in Minnesota called St. David's. Okay. So for me, what they did for my son, helping him speak and learn him to just to grow, I always been indebted to him. So I do a lot for a special needs program. But once I retired and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, mm-hmm. and I wasn't really sure. So guys started coming to me about golf events. And, you know, I was you going love to. golfing. Well, it was just when in Minnesota, when it, it starts snowing here in November and stuff, I go, I got to I got to take some time somewhere and go play work on my golf game. Uh-huh. So I was going places and was just meeting people in general, but I started meeting other former players. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you, you, you're talking to guys, you start talking about football. And I start asking guys, what are they up to? What are they doing? Mm-hmm. And then I started hearing guys saying that some guys were saying, I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Or all of a sudden hear, hearing guys having issues. Mm-hmm. And so I was calling the league, asking the league questions saying, Hey, I got a guy here in say Jacksonville. He's not doing well. And is there anything we can do for him? And all of a sudden, the league would either contact me back or the trust would. Mm-hmm. So as I started doing this more, finding finding guys, to me, I always said what helped me elevate my career mm-hmm. in the NFL and in college and in high school was my teammates. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out to me, it was about giving back to my teammates. So the legendary community allowed me to do that. Mm-hmm. And so to this day, man, I'm always reaching out, trying to find those guys that may not want to be talking to somebody in the, the medical field mm-hmm. who, is, who may, a guy who may have mental health problems. A guy may just not feel comfortable talking to people. But for me, that locker room was – a place where we trusted each other, where we could talk to each other about almost anything. Mm-hmm. And the legend community to me is an extension of that locker room. So for me, like I go to New York and I do a charity for Joe Namath for the March of Dimes, where we raise a million dollars in one day for the March of Dimes. Mm. I, I do Derek Brooks golf tournament. I do Jim Kelly's. I do work done. Mm-hmm. I do, um, went out in California for uh, the Navy SEALs Museum, which is, I do it with multiple other Hall of Fame guys, but other guys were just in California. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, as you start talking to guys, somebody tells you about a legend, or people call them former players, I like to call them legends, mm-hmm. that may not be doing well. So going to these events, talking with guys, it allows me to talk to them, and all of a sudden, find out about somebody, and then... I would actually drive over or call this guy and speak to him to see what I could do for him. Mm-hmm. Like here in Minnesota, since where I live, I have so many guys. I have one guy who was going through a kidney transplant. The next day after his surgery, I was there in the morning in his room, sitting there talking to him. And when he opened his eyes and looked up at me, he was like, hey. man, I'm so glad to see right, you. Right. someone here. And to see that you care about me. Because when we when we leave that locker room, we all kind of feel as if we're in a new element and in our journey, it's it seems uncertain. We're not really sure where we're going. Mm-hmm. And to have a familiar face on that journey, man, that's huge. Big time. It's yeah, it's just huge. It just gives a guy a sigh of relief, man. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That if he's got something going on, like he may need some personal issue. He may just need just an assistance with something that a program that that's available through the either the NFL, the trust or the player care mm-hmm. that I can help him out with. And Hey, give back. And that's why I always, my mom always told me that she goes, you got to take care of your friends and take care of people that you care about. Mm-hmm. So for me, being part of the legend community, it has allowed that. And I, and I do it. Every pretty much every day, I'm doing something to um, 
give back. Love that. From, from calling a guy on his birthday to if a guy like today, a guy called me and he was talking about he wanted some he wanted some Jordans. I go, you size 15? <laughs> yeah. I said, man, I'm going to give you my Jordan. Right. I got Jordan for you. So that's what I do. And I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. And that there's a program that allows me to do this because for me, I care about our guys. And it's not about guys I play with, it's guys I played against. Right. I Man, I look out to 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 Herman Moore, Lomas Brown, yeah, Emmett Smith. I talk to all the guys. I just hey, I sit down and talk to them, and I'm like, listen, man, is there anybody that you heard that may be in need of some service that we could try to look out for? Oh, yeah, I got a guy. And because for us, that word of mouth is huge. Right. It's Huge. Right. Because we know guys don't, we're so strong. We don't want to, oh man, I don't want to tell anybody that I'm not doing well. And that's what I do, man. Man. All right. So, and that's a whole lot. I mean, I know that is a I'm whole sorry. lot. I mean, you said like, sorry. I know like, you asked me. No, I'm sorry I had to throw it oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying it's a long answer. I'm saying what you do is a whole lot. Like you said, it like, Hey, this is something that I get up. I do. That's a lot being there for one another and being a resource to one another that's a lot that's a lot yeah. and, and and it takes a, a a beautiful spirit uh just people who care to be able to to do those things let me ask you this do you think some of the things that you're dealing with are based upon based upon maybe not understanding what their worth is long before, like during high school, um, during middle school, during college to learn what your value is and what your worth is. Because by the time you get out of the game, you feel like your worth was making plays, showing up to the facility, you know, putting on the helmet, your number, your name on the back of your jersey. How much do you think that play is a part in some of these guys needing that type of assistance after they're done playing? Well, for me, I, I didn't realize it, but I was already getting ready to retire a, a long, I mean, early in my career because coming into it as a guy who grew up chopping cotton for $2 an hour, I was saying to myself that, hey, I, I, I'm, when I'm done with this game, I don't want to be working. So I was always putting stuff, putting my money on the side and working to find other relationships with, with companies. So. I was already working on that. And but but what I didn't realize was it was teaching me to be personable, to never think I'm way up, way up top, so that I can talk to people, build relationships. And it it helped me so much that to be able to just go up to a person, have a conversation, and just just and just have a conversation, just find a way to just start up a conversation because a lot of times I mean, I'm, I'm around a lot of athletes, not from basketball, baseball, because when you're doing all these events, you see the guys who say they're celebrities and you kind of see how they're standoffish. But I just found it just personal myself. So to be so personable to speak to people and just because just as you're being, you think you're being standoffish, that person over there is looking at you and they're like in awe and, and they're afraid to come talk to you. So I just found that how I wanted to be. And it just taught me just to lower my guard and just to and just speak to people because you just never know where the conversation may go. And a lot of it was was built upon my mom, the way she the way she brought me up about speaking to people. And a lot of time us athletes, even current and former players, we we kind of just lose that because, and then when we get done playing, we've been basically going to that same way day after day, year after year. And then nothing. And all, yeah. Nothing. And all of a sudden you come out of it, you come out of it. And I tell people sometimes I was like, it's like being on a freeway that you just driving. And all of a sudden now you, you have to take us, your career ends. It, it's here's a good, I always say like, you, you, you've been on a bus partying and hanging out, enjoying it. And all of a sudden they drop you off and you're like, where do I go from here? And, and if you don't have assets in your pocket or a map 
that's kind of saying, okay, here's your next step. Mm -hmm. A lot of times guys are lost. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and one of the things that I try to do with uh, some of the teams I work with is start telling guys before you're done, let's try to figure out what's your next step. Because you get done, there's not going to be any more pats on the back, people Thousands and you. thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. 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 Oh, we love you. I said, it's gone. When it's gone. gone. And you're you're you almost like being in the dark. You're trying to feel and, and you see guys going, I, I got money, but I don't know what to do with it. Right. Oh, I, I got here's an investment. This sounds good to, to get into. And I'm like, that's not a good idea. Not a good one. And, right. And I'm and I'm telling you what, man, it's it's sometimes it's this. It's how God puts – I have guys here in Minnesota, Randall McDaniel. He gets done playing, and Randall doesn't buy anything. Randall McDaniel, <laughs> he goes back to being a substitute school teacher. Okay. So I'm talking to him, and I go to him, and I say, so tell me some of the things you're doing. And he's just, okay, here's what I do. I go teach. Then after, after teaching, I go hit golf balls. He said, I go home. And those guys are one I look for to talk to other guys, yeah. telling them, all right, here's a guy you want to talk Keep to. Keep it simple. Yes. Keep it simple. You don't need all this stuff. Yeah. Right. And 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 don't be thinking you want to still try to go out there and spend like, dude, let's, let's put yourself on a budget. Yes. And let's try to find something that that interests you. Yeah. Is it coaching? Is it is it uh, talking to people? Is it um, from one of my guys, he went from playing three years in the league to coaching at a high school, from coaching at a high school, he's now coaching at a college because he wants to get back in the pros. But I just work with my guys from having a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. but I always tell them, man, it starts slow. And I don't want to hear about these investments. You, a, a, a get rich scheme. I'm like, if it's such a good scheme, why is he looking for your money? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, the name, image, likeness, the NIL with the college deal. I feel like it's relatable to what you just said, because if guys are are able to maybe get the education of what their name, image and likeness represents at an earlier stage in their career, then they ultimately can possibly have some of those pitfalls early on and still be able to recover and, and because they have so much more of their career left. You know, what's your what's your stance on the naming image likeness in, uh, in college sports? And it's even touching high school sports now where guys can monetize their brands as they move forward. To me, I say it's a great thing because a guy doesn't necessarily have to play pro ball to be able to monetize their accomplishments at this point. But I know sometimes it, it can muddy the waters it can become more of a priority than everything else if not looked at or done correctly. Where do you stand on that? And and how does it relate maybe to some of the things you just said in terms of investments and where your money goes and what you want to do with your brand? I think, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's good that the college guys are getting, getting, being able to do this because we know so many guys who have been, successful have successful careers in college then get to the pros and it, it falters it's one or two years and they're done yeah and or if a guy gets hurt his first year in the pros and so but i'm i'm all for that i got a i've got a nephew who's actually in college now he's not a starter but that's what he's dealing with he's talking about you know we've sitting there talking about it mm -hmm. and finding different ways for him to advance himself. And one of the things I told him, I said, if you're not a starter, I go, here's something else you can do. I'm like, you can get on Instagram or Twitter and you could do little post interviews with the guys on your team. Cause he's at a big major school, mm -hmm. but I'm like, you could do interviews with the guys who made major plays in the games. Cause he kind of wants to get into radio and television. Mm -hmm. And I go, that right there can kind of launch your career. You working at it now while you're in college and working on it with your degree and you can, you can kind of feel what you want to do, but yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. 
And I, I, I wish a lot more guys would think about the, the financial side of it, but the, the budgeting side of it, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things from guys I deal with. It, it's, God, I mean, there's guys who have a problem with being done playing and they have the assets, but then there's these other ones who are trying to do deals and they're doing deals that are not good deals. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've been through, I've seen these guys at the card shows. I've seen these guys, uh, God, just, and just the different endeavors I've seen out there over the years. And I mean, I retired in 2003 and there's so many different things, avenues of guys are trying to get into. Mm -hmm. But I always tell them, I'm like, go, go back where your bread is buttered. And if, if you have a, if you're thinking about, you want to make, yourself known more then go back to where you played at yeah go back to, yeah go back to where you played at. because i i was telling the guy matter of fact he played at a well-known team on the east coast and he now lives on the west coast and one of the problems he was just he was telling me yesterday he said i can't make any money out here i'm going dude you're on the west coast you played on the east coast no one knows who you are go back and so it's it's kind of you really have to get down to to knowing the guy, yeah. really knowing the situation. But I I'm I'm happy that these college guys are are being able to do do to do this. I know back at Texas A and M where I grew up at down in College Station, that head coach is making crazy amounts of money, mm -hmm. and we all know in college football, no one really remembers the players; they just remember the coaches, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I'm like. Yeah, I'm like, but who is the one who made this coach successful? Right. The player. The player. And right. Yeah, you know, you think about it in these college, I mean, down in because I know more about Texas, but yeah, I know sure. like RG3 yeah. uh and Johnny Manziel. Could you imagine how much they could have generated? Exactly. I mean, you think about it, each time those guys won the Heisman Trophy, they put a statue outside of their stadium. Right. And I'm like, okay. That statue is great, but for a lot of these guys, they need to asset. Yes. And it just goes a long way. And, you know, a young guy, when I'm talking to him, say he's in his 20s or he's in his 30s or even his 40s, one of the things I'm always telling those guys to be more focused on is my health insurance, man. Mm -hmm. You need health insurance because the money only going to last so long. But Your body going to need that maintenance. Yes. Oof. And I go, go on in. I said, just like your car, man, you think about it. You start getting those miles on it. Mm -hmm. This stuff starts adding up. And man, I'm from, from getting in the hall. I, I remember a few players I met when I got in there. Um, one guy, he, he came in, uh, um, not Bobby Bell. Oh my God. Uh, Bobby Mitchell. Mm -hmm. for instance. Shots out to Bobby remember, Mitchell. Yes, yes, the sir. Dude, yeah. I, dude, I, I remember going to his golf tournament, sitting there having conversations with him, and then all of a sudden watching his health deteriorate. Yeah. And it brought tears to my eyes, man. And I'm sitting there going, wondering, like, does he have the proper health care? Yeah. You know, so right. that's how I how I think. And you know, I've gotten had the fortunate pleasure of meeting a lot of guys who've gotten in the hall and they're older guys, and I've seen them over the years from getting dementia. And since we have all these programs, that's the first thing I'll be trying to tell guys. I'm like, let me tell you about our program. We have that, that all available. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of guys don't, cause a lot of guys when they're done playing, they just kind of turn their back on NFL and, and the, the, the trust and all that. And I'm always trying to get these guys to like turn back around. There's so many things out there that can help you from, from getting a, a hip replaced, getting your knee replaced, uh, and and just so many programs that are out there available, our new pension program, and so it's just sad sometimes to see what happens to a lot of guys when they get up in age and they don't have the assets or the health care that that they need. Ah, man, you you hitting on a lot of a lot of great points. Let 
let me hit you with this one. And looking at what you've done and what you're continuing to accomplish by being a person of service, is there a defining moment for you in terms of your success and what you wanted to accomplish as a player, your success and what you're accomplishing in being a person of service? Did they did they combine? Do you have a moment like we we all have vivid memories of things that kind of take us down, take us to a place where it's like I either can do it. I have to do it. (laughs) I need to do it. And maybe it's all of the above. Do you have a moment that just jumps out at you where it could be an inspiration to somebody? Because My ultimate goal is is to get responses that are so unique to where you are from and what you have going on in you and what you've had going on in your life, that somebody that comes from where you come from is going to hear this and they're going to be like, I knew I could make it. Like, this sounds just like what I went through. This sounds like the moment I had. Do you have one? Oh, God. My, mine, I'm, mine still is going on. All right. Uh, because for me, I, I was coming into the league. My brother was at down at Tampa Bay playing Mike Linebacker. So I go down there, and they're telling me, hey, you should be here with your brother. Put you as a Mike Linebacker or outside linebacker. And I paused for a moment. I said, oh, no. <laughs> I'm not a linebacker. Uh-huh. I'm a defensive lineman. Right then and there, I'm like going against everything that they told me. They they all going, you could be here. I go, no, this isn't a place for me. What? What what are you talking about? It's not the place for me. So I leave Tampa and they're like, we're gonna sign you a free agent. Nobody really wants you. I go, there's another team I think I may have a chance with. How do you know? I go, well, I got this football magazine and I've been looking at it and they're defensive linemen all about my size six one six two yeah <laughs> right. and the, the biggest dude about 275 I think I could do it where is this in Minnesota uh, Minnesota wait a minute you gonna leave Tampa with all these palm trees you gonna go up to the north where it's freezing I think that's where I belong what hey you may get there you may not last maybe a year or two but that's gonna be it I go something Lord above is telling me that's where I'm supposed to be. Wow. I made that decision in 1990, and it's 2021. Wow. And I'm like, look at me now from a decision I made. So I always say there's an alarm clock somewhere. Bet on yourself. That it may be wake up because I'm living a dream. I mean, I came into it as a free agent. The guy was like third or fourth on 14. The guy had a guy named Marion Hobbs, who's now a coach in the league, was in front of me, had all these other dudes, Al Noga, Hendricks, Thomas, Kenny Clark, Thomas Struthers. And they were like looking at me, no, nah, you're not going to make you undersized. You're undersized. Yes. How- and I'm like, and it, it was like when I got here, I mean. It's like early yeah. on, you oversized. Yes. Now yes. all of a sudden you undersized. Size. You go. They, I, they go. Hey, you got to be six five. What? Why I got to be six five? Because hey, you got to be same size with these guys. And now I hear. Now you hear. I'm watching TV, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, Aaron Donald. It's, that's the way you do it." Wow. That's, I'm like, and that's you. That was you. That was me. I mean, that was that was myself. That was Russell Merrill. Yeah. That was Michael Dean Perry. Yeah. There was, uh, but they weren't uh, like you though. I mean, Michael Dean and it was nice. I, I get it. Russell Maryland, he was a different type of animal too. But yes, you but was I, the closest. Like Aaron Donald, that's your body type. That's your movement. That's high energy, high hands. Yes, the hands, the the, the hands. I know that. Come on, the, man. The, I, but but when I got here, they were saying, no, no, no. You 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 gonna get? They are gonna run at you? I'm going, dude. We're already working on. Jabble lay swimming over the guys right. using my hands. Like, like, 
Uh, you may laugh. Y'all, y'all used me. to use punching gloves in practice. Oh, dude, we had the we had the, had the hands extended. Right. That you learned to you had to put one hand in your pocket, man, and work on one hand. Huh. But to me, I can't just say one moment because it, I could say I could pick out when I first started, or I could say when I went to Seattle, or I could say when I got my hundred sack on Troy Aikman over Larry Allen, who was bench pressing 692 pounds. World. And I was like, I know, yeah, and I was like looking at Larry like, yes, I can get you. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking up and I can get you. I can take your soul, brother. Yes. Yeah. But for me, man, this is all. It's man, all a just, moment. Yes, because man, man I, I grew up chopping cod, man, $2 an hour, walking down the field with a hoe like this. And I'm like, look where God had helped me get to and where I'm at. And I'm like, and yeah. So and there I'm, can be no excuse. There can be no yes. excuses to what your, if you set your mind to what your trajectory is supposed to be, there can be no excuse. No. And, and also this biggest thing, don't, don't let anybody tell you, you can't do That's right. what you want to do. That's right. Because they're gonna be doubted. There's gonna be people gonna be telling you that you can't do. Oh, you, 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 you from here? You, you, you're too small. You're too little, dude. You can put your mind to it. And you can achieve it. You can achieve it, man. All right, I got. You. I, I, hey, it's like my, it's like my golf game, right? I was shooting a hundred and something. Now I shoot. I ain't gonna say really. I, I shoot about 74, 75. You put your mind to it, baby. I know that's right. All right, I got two more for you, and then I'm going to let you get up out of here. One, we talked about the NIL and and different things like that. Branding. I don't know if you were aware that you were branding yourself. I don't know that your style, how you did things, how you handled things was was pre-brand, you know, era where it's like everything you do is based around how you do it, why you do it, and how is that monetizable. That was you back in yeah. the day. Like we came on to the to the interview joking around, thunder. thunder. Like that was <laughs> you, your energy, your your personality, like how you were, even like with the Madden games and stuff like that. Like all the things that you did were so unique to who you are, were you aware of that and and just knew that this is my brand? Was it something that you were unaware of and it just kind of materialized? Branding, what, like, how was that? How did that work for you? Oh, oh my God. We were, you know what? We were just, I was just doing what I, what was just natural. We, even down to the face paint that I see everybody wearing, we were, God, you was we the first one lock- doing that. I, 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 I didn't even think about it. I was just sitting there going, you know, in my locker one day, and we had watched the movie Young Gun. Yeah, of course. With, uh, Lou, Lou, Lou Diamond Phillips. Phillips. Yeah, right. And Emilio like, Estevez. Yes, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were, yeah. And when he was going over that hill, essay, essay. And they was like, what did that mean? It meant stop. But the horse kept going. <laughs> so we all sitting there. I'm like, <laughs> man. I was sitting there one day going, dude. You know what, man? We got to get to that next level. And I'm like, when you're playing, when you're playing football, you gotta first of all, it's not a job. You gotta look at it as a hobby, mm-hmm. the hobby you love to do. Mm-hmm. And to for me, pass rushing was that. So I was a dude like I coached John Turley was like, he was really just like you'd be walking down the hallway, he put his hand in your chest. You got to get it, knock off. it off, right? Get it off. Yeah. He goes, if you to be, he goes to be great pass rushers. We gotta think like gazelles. I'm like, what you mean like gazelle? He goes, you don't see a gazelle, gazelle take a poop. He goes, he takes a poop as he's running. He, goes, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, we always gotta be on the go, right? <laughs> so, quick, yeah, he was quick like, on the go. Yeah. Oh my god! So we watch instead of just watching game tape. We watch animal we films. Were, yes. I'm I the, bad the, at the cheetah. The alligator pulling people down, and he goes, "You gotta have, have a hair trigger. You gotta be geeked. Be like, 
you just got to be high strong, man. We sit there and just like, like cowboys, because he said this to us one day. He said, you got to be like a cowboy. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you got to go from town to town because you're going to build a, re- a reputation. And when you come to that next town, next, another city to play. There goes Bronco Billy right there. Yeah. There, there, go, there go John Randall. Randall. There go wild John Randall. Right John there. Randall. Right. You got to be like wired up for Doc Holliday. Right. Ooh, all sit there your like, Ooh. Yeah, Say buddy. when. Yeah. Say when. Yeah. So that's what we started doing. But we never really saw it like we were branding. But we just we would have people come in. And you know what? Sometimes you just like, okay, I don't feel comfortable front of these people i don't know who they are right and i used to tell the dude do not show show them who you are do not hide it let it out let it out man. <laughs> so we were just like <laughs> yeah and we had a nickname for ourselves me and this guy named roy barker so we call ourselves misfits and um, so roy's from new york i'm like some said no in my lock he goes man we misfits i go misfit how we misfit Man, we're people that nobody really wants. Look at you, Johnny. You too small. Look at you. you. Short. But I'm looking at me. He goes, I'm from New York. I tell people how it is. Look at uh Shug. Shug's from he's from uh uh Flint. So we just gonna be us, man. We don't kill, we just gonna be us. I'm like, okay, let's do that. And so Misfit. We didn't realize. Yes, Misfit. Yeah, I was branding. Branding, dude. And we would come out there before the game and tell the people just you know, get up in your stance and you're just working on moves. We were hitting the goal pole, working on moves. Bah, bah, bah. And it was just something unique. The face paint, you know, we doing all that. It's not too late for y'all to continue to maximize y'all's brand. It's never too late because a brand never dies unless yeah, you allow it to. A brand never dies. That thing right there, yeah. that's an amazing story. And that's something I, I never heard of the whole myth. This fits thing. I didn't know about it. Oh, oh yeah. I, uh, Roy Bark, we just had to, and here in Minnesota, we just had a Legends weekend about two weeks ago. So Roy was on the other side of the room, and I just screamed out, Miss Fitz. We all just y'all came know, together. right? Yeah, y'all, See? right? Y'all know. So that's what I mean. That goes back to what I said, man. In football, which I think is in most in sports, it allows us to come together. And it doesn't matter about color. It's about just coming together as teammates and or, and, or against the old teammates, I mean, against opponents and stuff. I mean, you have that connection. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things for us in the legend community at the Super Bowl, at the Combine, where we have a room where guys can come back for that same element where you get guys together. Man, you hear stories. And for instance, I heard one of the coolest stories was uh, when we had, we it was before we started the legend community, but we had it in Canton, Ohio. It was the first time I had saw the same, experience, the same thing we have in the legend community. It was John Madden and Franco Harris mm. were sitting together. Man, they started talking about that immaculate reception. Mm. Bruh, mm. they went at it. Pointing, mm. talking. Oh no, no. So that's beautiful. And that's but that's what the locker room or the legend community allows us to yeah, have, right. man. And it's yeah. just beautiful. Let me let me let me end with this. For everything that John Randall has accomplished, for everything that he's doing, for everything that he will do. Do you think about what's your legacy? And if you oh, do, yes. tell tell us what is John Randall's legacy? Uh, this is kind of strange, but I, I, the way I look at it, I tell people this. I go because I'm I keep going and going, but I always say, uh, "Who's going to be at your funeral? Mm. Who's going to be there? Who's who's going to show up?" And that's the way I look at it. Because uh, we, I just lost my father-in-law uh, about three weeks ago, and we just had a Sorry memorial. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, but we just had his memorial, and man, we were sitting there, and you, and you start talking to people who are there, mm-hmm. and you see people from, you know, 
different parts of Minnesota. And I was sitting there thinking like, man, who's going to be at my funeral? You know, and the stories that they're going to tell about you. Because we heard stories about my father-in-law that it's going to be great stories. I'll tell you that. Yes. You know, you know that yours too. I mean, yours I got, too. I got my story about you. Listen, when we came to Seattle and, and I was, I was under Bruce's wing and Bruce was like, all right, okay. Okay. LA, we're going to go out. We're going to go eat. We're going to go eat. <laughs> That's hey, it. Hey, That's hey, it. hey, LA, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you in the uh, lobby in about 10 minutes. We're going to go eat. Okay. That's and it. then we went, we came and met you. At that restaurant, and that was the first time I had met you. We was playing, mm-hmm. we was playing. See, I don't even know if you remember, but I was just like John Randall and Bruce Smith, and I'm sitting here and I get to eat dinner with John yeah. Randall and Bruce Smith. And let me tell you something. People may like, well, how do you know this or how do you know that? And I sat there and listened to y'all talk. And listen to y'all joke around. And at the time, it was foreign to me to actually think we're going to jump up out of here and go eat with the people we're about to play against. Like, mm-hmm. it was foreign to me. And, yeah. and just understanding that in that moment, I learned that the camaraderie of the brotherhood was actually larger than the idea of playing against the team that you were going to play against, right? Yes. So, yes. I I mean, my my even my memory connected to you what my my conversation would be is just understanding that this thing is bigger than you and you got to come in and you got to do like just the way y'all were talking about the techniques and what y'all were thinking about and and different things and then y'all would transition into life and what that represented and all I could sit there and think of was man I'm so far away from this I was so far away you got to think in 2000 my rookie season, which I believe that's what the year the year that it was that we came to Seattle and and mm-hmm. you were there. I was still so wet behind the ears as a rookie. That's my rookie season, so I'm sitting there. I'm just trying to figure it out, you know. So to sit there and listen to two guys that you knew were going to be in the hall, and you knew that they were different, you knew that their road led to greatness, just being able to sit there and learn from that. I ultimately, like a lot of the things that you did, I did. Like that high energy stuff, I did it. That was, I I would not allow myself because of guys like you and and Ray Lou, I would not allow myself to not be on 10 when I was playing. Yes, sir. I was just, that was just what it was going to be. Like, I'm going to play hard. I'm going to try to wear your ass out. out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I remember that, dude. I remember that. That's awesome. Let me man. tell you, I still, I talk to Bruce and Thurman Thomas like every week. That's awesome. And Bruce, I play Bruce and out and Thurman play golf together. I mean, it's this constant conversation. Yeah. And the stuff you're talking about. I was I was going to Dallas for uh, Emma Smith golf tournament, and I would get down there, and I was talking to this guy. One day, I talked to him again and again and again, talking about pass rush, and I would tell him, I said, when you get tired, because we were talking about when you get tired, and I said, when you get tired, what do you do? I, I go, you look down, don't you? He goes, yes. I go, right right on your shoes, put finish. Nice. But put finish on your shoes. I go, people are going to look at it and go like, finish. They're not going to understand it. Uh-huh. And I go, when you're playing, when you're trying to be a pass rusher or rushing a quarterback, you're going to do things that just don't make sense. I know. I said, that's people right. don't understand it. Right. I said, you play 60 to 70 plays and you're only trying to get there at one time. Right. And you hope you can get there two or three. I go, that's how you got to think. But I had that same, when I'm talking, but the person I'm talking about was DeMarcus Ware. Wow. And I just sit there and just talking to him. I'm like, hey, you're going to be out there. You're going to feel like you're not sure. I go, believe in it. Wow. You got to believe in it. So that's exactly it, man. That's It's just, like you said, the game is so much it's, more. Yeah. And just that it's pride. So, that pride, yes. man. Because even here's another one. When we were in Mexico City and we were golfing. <laughs> yeah. 
and and you had your select you had your select sticks with you and yep. gracious enough to give me a give me a cigar you know what yes. i mean and you don't even know how that made me feel by the way you know i i what? I, I i felt very very like truly important that john randall shared one of his cigars with me in that moment like i'm humbled by by guys like you because I'm a fan first. And I I'll, I'll ultimately say a legacy that is is worth having is having people be a fan of you more than yes. anything else. Like yes, the memories of how kind you are as a person, how you treated people around you. Did you open the door for a person, whether it was a male or or a female? Oh, it didn't yes, it doesn't matter, right? How you greet a person. People don't say yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, anymore. People don't people don't exercise fundamental values and respect anymore. And I just look at guys like you and and like Bruce and and those guys that I had the opportunity to be around and mold who I am it it's imperative to me for my legacy to represent those lessons every day yes sir dude it has to represent yes, that every day you know and that's, that's that's the whole point of this right yes sir as i want people to hear i want this to go out and everybody hear like this is john randall like, yeah, these new school cats might be like, who is this dude? Yeah, who's this guy? I, and I, oh my God, I wanted to, I'm telling you, I got to tell you this weird story. When Jerry Jones got in Kenton, Hall of Fame, I, I, I went by the uh, his party. I was going to go see my man, Leon Lett, because mm-hmm. I always got to go talk to my boy Lett. So I, I see Leon, we having a conversation, blah, blah, blah. I look over, man. There's about six guys bowing down, look on like this. I'm like, what the hell wrong with them? <laughs> they go, he looks, Leon looks at me and goes, man, they've been watching your film, Johnny. They know who you are. I'm like, man. That's so, clean. Now that's, that's when it matters. Yeah. That, and so I, I get it now, but man, I, all I tried to do was go out there and give 110%. Training camp, it didn't matter. Practice, because like I told those guys, man, I could be chopping cotton, Indeed. but I'm doing this. I know that's I'm, right. I'm gonna, hey, I'm gonna give you all I got because, man, I'm a hey, like uh, the movie Color Purple. I'm here. I'm here. I, I may, may be, be black. black. I may be ugly, but, but I'm, I'm here. here. Hey, man, that is John Randall. Y'all have just been blessed by one of the goats of goats. This is Up On Game presents Conversations with a Legend. This has got to be one of the most amazing moments for me and in my professional career uh, in interviewing and broadcasting and media. I can't thank you enough for giving me the time that you gave me uh, today. And, And I'm hoping that these stories continue to be a motivation for us to aspire and to inspire to be more and to do more without the excuses. Let's get it done. Look at your toes, look at your feet, 10 toes down, finish. 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 Love it, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Um, And yeah, we're going to talk about your branding too, by the way. We're going to circle up. We're going to circle up on this. All right. Let me know. All right. Hey, Y'all been blessed. Till next time, Up On Game presents Conversations with a Legend, baby.